Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Medford United Methodist Church. My name is Joe Monahan. On behalf of our Associate Pastor Rachel Callender, the staff, the congregation, I want to say thank you for being with us this morning. I want to say a special word of welcome to those who are worshiping with us online this morning. So we are grateful that you've decided to join us. Today we are starting a new series, and it's called What Makes a Methodist? And it's about some of the ways that our uh, way of being Christian are uh, distinctive, and we're looking forward to that. Rachel and I love talking about this stuff, and so I'm looking forward to hearing again today's uh, message. Got a chance to hear it at 9 o'clock and look forward to hearing it again. So in just a moment, the ushers are going to be coming around with the red attendance pads, and we hope that uh, you'll take a moment that you'll uh, share your contact information. Let us know that you've been here. And especially if you're visiting with us for the first time, I hope that you'll uh, share your information so that we can be in touch with you and let you know about things that are going on here at the church. Likewise, if you're online, you can let us know that you're here. We hope that you'll leave a comment, uh, that you'll share the stream. And uh, you can also go to our online attendance form at medfordumc.org slash online dash attendance, or you can get there through the app. And if you haven't uh, downloaded our app yet, we encourage you to do that. You can get a daily devotional. You can catch up on worship content. You can manage your giving and uh, more through the app. And so you just text the word Medford app, all one word, to 833-700-2226. And so if you'd like to make a gift to support our ministry, uh, you, again, you can use the app. You can visit our website at medfordumc.org slash give. Or you can send a check to the church here at 2 Hartford Road, Medford, New Jersey, 08055. And there's an offering plate in the back where you can drop a gift as well. I think uh, I just want to share one announcement, and really it's a thank you. And I want to say thank you to everybody who helped with our very successful National Night Out presence on Tuesday night. Medford Township uh, Police Department puts together this opportunity for the community to come together and for community organizations to be uh, highlighted and showcased. And I'm really, really excited about the response that we had uh, to our booth. We had lines of kids waiting to have their faces painted, waited, uh, waiting to get uh, balloons uh, put on their heads. And uh, the last kid got the balloon animal stuck on uh, his head. It was after dark. We were doing it in the lights of the fire trucks. And so I'm just really grateful uh, to everybody, and especially uh, Jim and Kim Baker, um, who helped to lead our uh, Reconciling Ministries team in that. I want to uh, say a thank you to Erica Williams, who stepped in also to paint. Um, that was really, I'm really grateful for that. And Heather McKinney as well, who was doing tattoos. Um, uh, Laura Beveridge, uh, George Ballinger. Uh, we had so much help from so many wonderful people. I'm just really grateful for everybody who stepped in. And over the next couple of days, we're going to try to post some pictures um, for, for our Facebook and Instagram pages as well, uh, so you can see kind of the scale of the number of people that we had. But I want to thank you all for the effort that you put into this. And as always, if you would like to uh, find out more about things that are going on here at the church, you can uh, get to our weekly email through our app. And if you haven't signed up for the weekly email, that's one of the things that we will do uh, when you share with us your contact information through the red attendance pad. We'll put you on the list to make sure that you get that. And if you're ever not sure about how to get involved in something that you hear about here um, that we announce on a Sunday morning, then you can just send an email to the church office as well, and uh, we'll make sure that we connect you with the right person. So I think that those are all the announcements. I'm going to turn to Rachel to share our call to worship. You're invited to stand as you're able and comfortable in the call to worship. When we feel that we are not good enough. Remember the Lord's grace. When we know that we could have been kinder. Remember the Lord's grace. When we wonder if we could have done more. Remember that the Lord's grace is not measured by any of these things. The Lord's grace is our being loved into being. Our opening hymn is O oh, Four Thousand Tongues to Sing.
Amen. You may be seated. I invite you to join me in the opening prayer. God of grace, we gather this morning each with our own unique set of circumstances. Green, grief, celebration, sorrow, gratitude, hopelessness. May this time of worship be a time to connect with both you and with those around us. May it be a time to share in our praise and share the weight of pain. Enter this space, Lord. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Our reading this morning is from the Epistle to the Romans, chapter 3, verses 21 through 26. But now God's righteousness has been revealed apart from the law, which is confirmed by the law and the prophets. God's righteousness comes through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ for all who have faith in him. There is no distinction. All have sinned and fall short of God's glory, but all are treated as righteous freely by his grace because of a ransom that was paid by Christ Jesus. Through his faithfulness, God displayed Jesus as the place of sacrifice where mercy is found by means of his blood. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness in passing over sins that happened before during the time of God's patient tolerance. He also did this to demonstrate that he is righteous in the present time and to treat the one who has faith in Jesus as righteous. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us come to God in prayer. Holy Lord, this morning we crave your word. We are eager to have you speak to us today so that we may grow in our faith. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, God, now and forever. Amen. Are your failures haunting you? If so, I'd say you're in good company. Our entire being seems to be based on knowing and succeeding and being better and stronger and smarter than others. Anxieties are at an all-time high over making any sort of mistake, and everything we do, from our jobs to just regularly buying a coffee at the same shop, is all a reward system. I did, I did this, so I deserve that. 
I bought five coffees, so I get a free one. Overextended work weeks are braggable, and with social media, we can manipulate our stories, our narratives, to drive down deeper our undealt with in insecurities over not being good enough. And this all makes me think of a story that a preacher once shared about a moment that he had, a teaching moment, really, between him and his son. So he writes, My six-year-old son used one of those super adhesive glues on a model airplane that he was building. In less than three minutes, his right index finger was bonded securely to the shiny blue wing of his DC-10. He tried to free it. He tugged. He pulled like a cat with tape stuck to its paw, kind of waved it frantically, but he couldn't budge his finger free. So finally, he came to me for help. And as tears began to well up in his eyes out of frustration and embarrassment and stupidity, I worked hard not to laugh. And as I looked at him, I suddenly remembered the scene I I'd visited a new family in our neighborhood just a few nights earlier. The father of the family introduced his children. Well, this is Pete. He's a clumsy one of the lot. And that's Kathy coming in with mud on her shoes. She's a sloppy one. And as always, Mike's last. He'll be late to his own funeral, I promise you. This dad did a thorough job of gluing his children to their faults and mistakes. And I didn't want that to happen here. So as my son and I talked, I, unbeknownst to him, reached over and stuck my hand into the computer, which was in the process of printing my Sunday sermon. And as tears began to flow in my son's eyes, he finally held up his hand glued to the airplane wing, and I reached over to take hold of it with the hand that I had been concealing, which was now covered in black ink and randomly printed words. My son looked at my hand with amazement. Seeing his shock, I replied nonchalantly, you know, only truly great people put their whole selves into whatever they're doing. My son looked at me and smiled, I got some solvent for the two of us. Oh, and by the way, today my son is all grown up and he designs airplanes for a living. God's unwillingness to glue us to our wrongs, that's where we're going to get our new series this morning. And so they say that preachers only actually have one sermon and that if you dig through years, decades worth of Sunday morning material and people layers. It doesn't matter the topic because the takeaway remains the same no matter what. So here's mine. God loves you and there's just absolutely nothing you can do about it. It's very Methodist, actually very reformed in its message. We'll get more to that in a moment. But here's what's interesting. With that statement, I just divided the room because my guess is that when you hear that, one of two knee-jerk reactions bubbles up inside of you. So one, well, duh, of course, that's why we're here. But knowing and living that out are two different things. And then two, yeah, right. I've been around the block. This doesn't seem like love. If either of those seem to be where you want to lean, good news, from there, the match is struck for a theological movement birthed in retrieving the slivers of God's in the darkest, most painful, most hopeless areas of life, which then became one of the world's largest Protestant denominations with 12 million United Methodists and 80 million total Methodist-affiliated members across the planet. When developing this series on what makes a Methodist, I struggled a bit, as I mentioned in Friday's newsletter, about how to consolidate an almost 300-year movement into five small little topics. But no matter what themes I was throwing around for the different weeks, where to begin was obvious and unwavering. Grace. There is no Methodist movement without grace. And like any good Methodist preacher, actually my third sermon this year alone on grace and it probably is not my last. Grace links at the very core of our Christian faith is basically the whole deal. It may have even been one of the first Christian concepts that most people have been taught. Yet, it is also the same concept that people still struggle with their whole lives till their dying day. Grace, the beating heart of Methodism. 
So our text today comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, the longest of his letters written in Corinth roughly 25 years after the death and resurrection of Christ. And the reasoning behind my choosing this text is that it was when hearing specifically about this book, Methodism's founder, John Wesley, had his famous heart strangely warmed moment, which is considered the birth date of Methodism, Aldersgate Day, May 24th, 1731. We're coming up on 300 years. So let me get us to that moment. So we'll talk about a little bit of Methodist history to start us off. I will try to be brief, but I can promise nothing. John was a priest in the Church of England long before he had any sort of conversion experience. And this isn't to say that he didn't believe that there was a God, but it is to say that he didn't get what the existence of God had really anything to do with him. He didn't feel it. God's love, God loves us, yes, great, that's nice, but it seems kind of hollow, almost irrelevant. What does that mean, God loves us? And all this coming from a priest, right? And here sits where many struggle with grace. It sounds very nice, but what does it have to do with me? John's father and brothers were all priests. He went into the family business, really, I can relate. But he constantly found himself at odds with his colleagues over what the actual point of faith and worship and God meant to the day-to-day person. And after a failure of a mission attempt in Georgia, along with a broken heart, he and his brother Charles returned to England very much with their tails between their legs, Something was missing in what they were trying to teach and preach. They found themselves with that holy envy I mentioned a few weeks ago towards the calm, unshakable faith of others, particularly the Moravians, a reformed German denomination. He didn't feel as though he was saved, so he kept trying to find, do, achieve that assurance in his salvation. But it wasn't until Charles fell unexpectedly ill, so ill that he was on the brink of death, that on Pentecost Sunday, Charles basically had a coming to terms moment in his very young age where he had to ask, am I okay with dying, with this really being it? Can I face God? And illness and death, they have a way of doing that to us, finally allowing us some clarity into who we actually are, who we have been, what we actually believe or don't believe. And so Charles then had a moment of what can only be described as a conversion, where he finally just sort of accepted the fact that the answer is probably no, that he hasn't done enough, hasn't always made God happy no matter how hard he tried in his ministry, but that he was going to get a pass anyway, that God's love was just so much bigger than his failures. And the freedom in that just completely changed his outlook on God and faith and service. And he wanted that so bad for his brother John, too. At this point, John was so miserable. And so John did what what all of us do on a Wednesday night. He went to go hear someone read Martin Luther's preface to the Book of Romans, the commentary on the Book of Romans, right? It's fun time. Uh, But... Who is Martin Luther but the priest who began the Protestant movement's whole point? The church needs to stop telling people to try to earn something from God that they already have, grace. So he's at Aldersgate Street, and he hears this message while reading, while being read the preface to the commentary on the Book of Romans. Grace, not a synonym to love, but a response of love. And we can see how the Romans text from today just screams that at us. It says, all have sinned and have fallen short of God's glory, but all are treated as righteous freely by his grace because of a ransom that was paid by Christ Jesus. And then later in Romans 11, but if it is by grace, it isn't by what's been done anymore. If it were, then God's grace isn't even grace. Fear tactics create timid, undaring faith, but grace creates empowered faith. I do good out of love, not to get love. That's empowered. I once heard it said that Christianity is not about loving Jesus. Christianity is about loving Judas. 
the birthday of Methodism, the genesis of a theological development is this. I've messed up. I failed. But I wasn't created to just wallow in my failures until I die. I was created out of love to be loved and to share love. And that means accepting the fact that God is just a whole lot quicker to forgive than we are. In the cost of discipleship, Bonhoeffer writes, by judging others, we blind ourselves to our own evil and to the grace which others are just as entitled to as we are. And so you can see how this theological revelation alone, the Wesleys really taking in the perspective that changed the course of Christianity forever, just two centuries earlier, it changed everything they did in their ministry. Seeing God's grace as something that's already beat you to the punch. It changes our reasoning for why we're not judging people. It changes our understanding of why we even bother forgiving. It changes why we decide to get up in the morning and do anything in this broken and painful world where we ourselves have had times where we've offered grace and love and kindness and have been met with hate and selfishness and rudeness. It doesn't mean you don't try to give grace again. It sure doesn't stop God. So if we can truly hook into that, not just here, but believe that God, the creator, offers grace freely, then everything else that we're doing changes. We finally can move on from our worst moments and actually do good. Be free from trying to get something out of it. So we have our Romans text about God's free grace. So just for fun, I'll throw in what's often used as a countertext to this theological perspective. James chapter 2, it's titled, Faith Without Works is Dead. And that's basically the premise of the text. And when we pair this with the text of our, Rome, our Romans text, I'd argue that they don't come in conflict with one another, even if they sound like they do. James's basic point is that if you actually have faith in God, then you would do good works, and he's right. But I caution the order at which we look at things. Romans is saying that, that we have been freely offered grace by God and that when we recognize that grace, we can build faith. Then James is saying that now because you've recognized that grace and can build faith, you can't, can't help but go and share that with others. There are two parts of the same timeline. God gives grace. We build faith. Faith inspires good. Irish poet and playwright Oscar Wilde once said, every day is another chance to get it wrong. We're going to get it wrong a lot. But God's grace has already given us the okay to try again. It reminds, us of the, reminds uh, me of the sentiment that an author once wrote where he said, you failed many times. Although you may not remember, you fell down the first time that you tried to walk. You almost drowned the first time you tried to swim, didn't you? Did you hit the, the ball the first time you swung a bat? Life consists of failure, but somewhere along the line, we have come to convince ourselves that failure is terminal. But the God of the cross and the empty tomb wants us to remember always that failure is not the end, to instead get back and try again and again. All nature shouts of this beginning again God who can make all of our failures regenerative, the one who is rising again, who never tires of fresh starts, second chances, nativities, renaissances in persons or in cultures. God is a God of starting over, of Genesis and regenesis. Don't put a period where God has put a comma. Don't put a period where God has only put a comma. So as we spend the next few weeks learning about the different defining traits of this wild tradition that we call Methodism, keep pulling it all back to grace, a grace from God that believes in human goodness above all else. So if you hear this message, God loves you and there's just nothing you can do about it, and think yes, but struggle to live it out, we're going to talk all about how John Wesley himself struggled with this his whole life, with a concept that he knew. He was such a workaholic. And if you hear that message, God loves you, and there's just nothing you can do about it, and are so overwhelmed by the pain in the world to feel that at all, 
start small. Because I bet you can find someone, someone whose goodness can help you believe that perhaps you really were created to be loved. Let us come to God in prayer. God of love, we give thanks for the way who has spoken to and inspired others who have come before us. We give thanks for the lessons you have taught to us through others. May we hear this word this morning so that we can live out a faith empowered by grace. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So over the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about the peace garden that we're planting here at the back corner of the property, and uh, we're really excited. The first crop has now been planted, and uh, we're looking forward to this new opportunity, both for fellowship and service within the life of the church. So far, we've spent about $1,000 on this project to get it up and running, and so if you would like to make a gift uh, to help defray that expense, we would very much appreciate it. If this is something that gets you excited, um, the prospect of being able to grow some vegetables, be able to start, um, the, the idea here is that this will help us to start a ministry of soup making here in the church. And so if this is something that excites you, you can write the word garden in the memo line of your check. You can also make a gift online uh, at medfordumc.org slash give or through the app. And you'll find in the drop down menu, the list of funds, you'll find uh, something labeled garden. So if you're interested in getting involved, uh, you can talk with Pastor Rachel. You can talk with Matt here at the front uh, or uh, Dave Sippler or Janine Reduker, any of those folks that you run into during the week, if you'd like to get involved with that. And we thank you not only uh, for your gifts, but for your support of all of our ministry together. We thank you.
say something, Burton, but I didn't want to embarrass you. So, but I wanted to thank you as well. Uh, Burton takes on many challenging pieces for us with the choir. And he actually took his cello to his hotel room on Wednesday night after we rehearsed to prepare for this morning. Because this was a real, this was a new and a challenging piece. And uh, thank you, Burton. join me in the prayer of dedication. Holy Lord, you have beautifully crafted within us the want to connect with others, to hear the cry of those in need, to see the places where we can share your love with others. May this be a start, a moment within a life of bringing faith to life through action and generosity so that all people may know they are loved. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> and it's not lost on me as you're playing that piece that the lyrics are, I ain't got long to stay here. So um, if you don't know, the Burton and Claire are going to be moving to South Carolina in the next uh, little bit. And so um, their last Sunday with us is going to be the first Sunday in September. And certainly we will miss them. And uh, we're grateful for your gifts today. As we prepare for communion, we invite those of you who are at home uh, to gather, the people who are there in your home with you, uh, maybe to grab some uh, bread or some crackers, juice or water and um, just bring everybody together. We encourage you to participate in the celebration of communion with us. If you haven't been here before in a United Methodist Church to receive communion, we remind you that the table does not belong to this church, but it belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ, and that he's the one who issues that invitation, and that invitation is to all people everywhere who seek to live in a new relationship with God and with their neighbor through him. So all of you are invited. As we... Um, prepare to celebrate, I'll just let you know we'll be using these uh, one-piece communion cups and we'll distribute them all to everyone and we encourage you to just hold them and then we'll receive them all together. We have a gluten-free option available as well if you need that and so um, we'll bring those around too so that if you need gluten-free just let the ushers know and be sure that you receive those. I think those are all the announcements, everything that we need to know as we get started. So I invite you to join me in the communion liturgy and the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right in a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. And you have done great things for us, God. So today we offer our joys and our celebrations and our thanksgivings. What are some of the joys that you bring with you this morning, whether here or whether online? The new Amen. For the new carnival, it was a fun time. My mom celebrated her 90th birthday. Congratulations, Louise. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. <laughs> are there others? Other joys? Amen. So you get to see your British family. Amen. Amen. So for time with your grand granddaughter. And so with your people on earth, 
and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and we join in there on ending him. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna. Blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, and we trust that whenever we gather in his name, whenever two or three are gathered, that you are here and present among us. And so we come to the table this morning knowing that there are things that we carry with us, burdens that we carry upon our hearts, people that we are concerned for. What are some of the concerns that you bring into the space, or what are some of the concerns that you have online? We invite you to share uh, you, people that you're praying for, please using first names only, but here in the space, who are you praying for today, or what are you praying about today? Amen. Amen. Holy God, by the baptism of Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he gave thanks to you, took the cup, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. joining us at home at this point in time if you have any elements in front of you we ask that you put your hands over the elements we invite you to join in this prayer now pour out your holy spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of the bread and the cup make them be for us the body and the blood of christ that we may be for the world the body of christ redeemed by his blood by your spirit make us one with christ one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. confidence of the children of God, let us pray as Christ taught us to. Our Father, who, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will, will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the, power and and the, the glory, glory forever. forever. Amen. Amen. We'll invite the ushers to come forward who will be serving this morning. And as we do that, we'll uh, invite Bruce to lead us in a little music. here in the room and friends at home, I invite you now, if you've not already done so, to receive first the bread with these words. It's the body of Christ and it's broken for you. We'll now receive the cup. And for those of you at home, you can share with these words. The blood of Christ shed for you. Let us conclude with a prayer of thanksgiving. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves to others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.
loves you, and there's this absolutely nothing you can do about it. And from that love comes a free grace, so pass it on. Go in peace and go with God. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.